Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this program on the prevention of peripheral neuropathy presented by the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy and featuring its patient education advisor, Dr. Shanna Patterson, an attending neurologist from Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. My name is Lindsay Colbert. I am the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's Executive Director, and I will be moderating today's program. On behalf of my staff and board of directors, I'd like to thank you once again for entrusting us to educate you on this important topic. Before I formally introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to go over some brief logistical matters for the program. This session is being recorded and will be permanently housed on the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's website for future reference, along with the slide deck that is accompanying the program. All questions that are pertinent to this content will be addressed at the end of Dr. Patterson's presentation. For any questions that we are unable to answer, please contact us via email or telephone and we'd be happy to further assist you. And now I'm pleased to introduce you all to Dr. Shanna Patterson. Dr. Patterson is the site chair in the Department of Neurology for Mount Sinai Westside Operations, as well as the director of special projects and system-wide neurology clinical operations. As I mentioned before, Dr. Patterson is a member of the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's advisor board. Additionally, Additional professional society affiliations include the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine and the American Academy of Neurology. She has authored chapters on EEG monitoring in the intensive care unit, the phrenic nerve, and neuromuscular junction disorders. Her clinical practice includes general outpatient neurology with a focus on peripheral neuromuscular disease and electrodiagnostic testing. And without further ado, I will pass the virtual mic over to you, Dr. Patterson. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Lindsay. It is always an honor to be here with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy and to hopefully help a number of individuals today think about uh, preventing peripheral neuropathy. Just to kind of give an overview of some of the topics that we will be covering, I wanted to kind of begin by uh, sort of contextualizing our discussion a little bit in terms of what prevention really means in this case. Um, it can, just so that everyone's on the page, same page, kind of define briefly what uh, neuropathy is, and then talk about a little bit about the historical per, uh, perspective on prevention of neuropathy and where we stand with an eye toward a couple specific examples of different types of neuropathy as well as what we know about neuropathy overall. And finally, we'll end with uh, an ex engaging discussion, but before that, we'll have a brief foray into some exciting work that's being done by the American Academy of Neurology with an eye toward really pushing the envelope for prevention of neurological illness and a preventive um, lens overall. So, First, I'd like to begin with uh, taking a step back. And when we think about what does it mean to prevent an illness or disease, sometimes um, it's important to make sure that we don't blame ourselves or others um, if we are able to not prevent that disease. One of the things then we, when we think about illness and chronic illness is that uh, sometimes there can unfortunately become this element of blame that can arise some explanations for this might be because society in general values the concept of having explanations for events in life. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to someone else? And you know, how can I prevent this from happening to me? Or why is this happening to me? And in a way it is uh, maybe driven also by a subconscious attraction to rationalizing illness, both in terms of why somebody gets sick and why somebody else doesn't. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of research, especially in the area of psychology, looking at uh, that, that idea when, it's, when that's turned toward yourself, this concept of self-blame for illness is associated with emotional distress and even sometimes exacerbation of physical illness. And I think that here we have um, in the upper right-hand corner, I've included one of the references that specifically um, relates to this and uh, refers to other types of research but that it's really, um, even though it may be sort of subconsciously or societally attractive um, to look at things this way, it can actually be really damaging, especially for individuals with this illness. Um, and it's important to kind of just be mindful 
of that as we enter into this conversation that anybody who has neuropathy, it is not your fault, even if you know you were potentially doing all of the things we're about to discuss today to prevent neuropathy, uh, some people may still certainly get neuropathy. And again, so recognizing even in a larger scale that many illnesses, including most instances of neuropathy, are not entirely preventable. Many times, <clears throat> as many of you may know, we don't even know why they happen. And certainly if you have neuropathy, it is not your fault. And just to give kind of one anecdotal example, for approximately 50% of people with diabetes, they have some form of neuropathy. But even in type 2 diabetics, where research has shown that the underlying drivers of um, how neuropathy arises may be more complex, even for some patients who have really good control over their blood sugar levels, it does not necessarily halt the progression of neuropathy. And of course, even with a rigorous workup, no cause for neuropathy can be found in about a quarter of cases, and we call those idiopathic neuropathy, again, just underscoring the fact that it is certainly not a space to lay blame or to blame oneself. Even if you're doing everything you can to prevent neuropathy, it may still occur and it is not your fault. And finally, I wanted to um, just speak a little bit about thinking about mindfulness that again, um, fostering a mindset of acceptance doing the best we can and being mindful of how our personal narrative, how we think about our health or our illness, why that's happening and, um, and, and whether or not we are to blame for that can have a significant impact. And again, going back to some of these psychology research studies, which have shown that blaming oneself consciously or subconsciously can really contribute in a significant way to distress. And so we want to make sure that, um, especially as we launch into this discussion, um, that uh, everyone is mindful um, and sort of uh, takes this in, with a lens of uh, being accepting of where you are in life, doing the best you can, um, and, and not beating yourself up, frankly. Moving forward a little bit, I wanted, I know everyone here is because they know about neuropathy, that's what has brought us together today, but I just wanted to take a step back again to think about what is peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy um, involves the peripheral nervous system and the peripheral nervous system in very broad strokes are all of the nerves outside of the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. So in essence, all of the nerves that are outside of the brain and the spinal cord, those larger nerve fibers that course down our arms and legs um, that help us feel things when we touch them and move our muscles, that's the peripheral nervous system. And also uh, the figure on the left shows a picture of the autonomic nervous system, which are some smaller diameter nerve fibers, which actually innervate the heart, the gut, the lungs, the intestines, and many of our other internal organs outside of the brain and helps them function as well. And sometimes those nerves can also be involved in peripheral neuropathy. And I moved to the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's website to again, grab just a, a general um, uh, definition of what peripheral neuropathy means. And in essence, peripheral neuropathy again occurs when peripheral nerves are damaged. Um, and, you know, for example, a message that might normally be coming from your fingertips or your feet about what something feels like can be disrupted, so you don't feel something or you have numbness. Sometimes it can be uh, in the form of symptoms that normally shouldn't be there, but now are there, and that can include feeling things like tingling or pain, burning sensations, and so forth. Sometimes it can involve weakness if the nerves that connect to muscles are involved. And sometimes if it involves the autonomic nervous system, different autonomic symptoms can arise. And these might include, uh, for example, uh, dizziness, dysfunction in sweating, uh, changes in bowel habits uh, and other things. And peripheral neuropathy, though we use this term as an umbrella term, it is certainly not a single disease. It is a general term for a series of disorders that result from damage to the body's peripheral nervous system. Um, and also uh, we should include a mention that peripheral neuropathy can sometimes include nerves all over the body, sometimes just a small number of nerves in one specific area. 
um, or individual nerves kind of in a patchy distribution. Let's think about, you know, we think about prevention and I think health prevention overall has gotten much more attention in recent years than it did maybe decades ago. <clears throat> and I thought it was really interesting and I wanted to mention that when you search on PubMed, PubMed is the name of an online database that you can, anyone can look at on uh, the internet where you can look up specific medical or scientific articles. And uh, this is a place where you can search by key term or author, and it's really just an index of pulling up those articles, and you can also search by disease. And interestingly, when you search by prevention of peripheral neuropathy, you can see that if we go back uh, to the middle of the 20th century, there were very few hits, if you will, uh, when you en enter that search term. And if you look at this amazing curve, you can see that in more recent years, 2024 itself is a smaller bar because it is uh, we're still very early into the year. But you can see that we have a lot of publications, um, almost more and more every year compared with the year before. And the bottom image is really just zooming in a little bit more to where we really see this great increase since the early 80s or so. Again, a lot more attention about preventing peripheral neuropathy. And so I think that it's also interesting to think about this because as much as we're going to discuss today, much of this wasn't understood if we go back even a few decades. And I do think it is kind of inspiring and interesting to think about and imagine where will we be um, in another 40 years from now or 20 years from now um, with all of this growing sustained attention on health prevention over or prevention of illness overall, maintaining health, and specifically also, of course, uh, preventing peripheral neuropathy. So we're pivoting a little bit to current perspectives on neuropathy prevention. And the first, there are a couple kind of very specific cases I wanted to discuss before we get into some general uh, recommendations. And it would be remiss not to begin with diabetic neuropathy because it is so common. Um, there are, in terms of research, when you read about research on preventing peripheral neuropathy, there are I would say several kind of flavors or categories of information that one tends to find. Some of these are certainly mentions of um, just global recommendations for nerve health or global recommendations about preventing neuropathy. What are, what's good for nerves, what's bad for nerves. But then there is a lot of very specific research centered around specific categories of neuropathy. And that includes certainly diabetic neuropathy um, and a few others. And these tend to be, of course, the most prevalent, among the most prevalent causes of peripheral neuropathy, which is what draws, in part, what draws so much attention. So what's interesting is diabetic neuropathy is, has a, there's a number of factors that influence diabetic neuropathy. And one of those may also be a genetic influence. Type, in type one diabetes, controlling the blood sugar levels usually is effective in reducing the incidence of diabetic neuropathy. But what's interesting about type 2 diabetes is that when they have done research on this in terms of what the cause is for neuropathy in type 2 diabetes, they found it can be much more complex. Um, and that because of that, it does not respond as simply as controlling one's blood sugar in type 1 diabetes. So if you have type 2 diabetes to say, oh, just get better control of your blood sugar, that may or may not have a significant impact on neuropathy in those patients. They found that for those patients, oftentimes it's a combination of controlling your blood sugar or glycemic control in addition to blood pressure control, an exercise program, and a healthy diet, for example. And the, um, there is an interesting position statement uh, by the American Diabetes Association. This, is, this one was published in 2017. And they do tend to have um, every several years um, updated position statements about diabetic neuropathy, which I think are really comprehensive and interesting. Um, the graphic here on the lower right hand side is not, we're not going to go into detail about this, but I think it does kind of interest, illustrate interestingly the complexity that is thought to go into neuropathy and type 2 diabetes. And the fact that it is not the glucose levels alone, which you can see glucose or blood sugar there and hyperglycemia, which is elevated blood sugar 
in the green highlights, but they're looking at different factors and they see that it is uh, much more complex in terms of what is contributing to the peripheral neuropathy in those cases. And it may include things like um, a number of other drivers of different kinds of damaging effects on the nerves. One potentially, I think, very interesting in part because it could, it could be somewhat easy to act upon for anybody um, is this link that is, uh, shows up in some recent articles, and I think you know, hopefully we will learn more about it over the years, which is a potential significant factor of vitamin D and specifically vitamin D deficiency in diabetic neuropathy. Vitamin D, which is the vitamin that um, we sometimes are making ourselves with exposure to the sun, but also of course we can take as a vitamin and we can get it in our diet from milk and other types of fortified grains and um, beverages and foods. Uh, vitamin D is really important for health. And we know that for a variety of broad array of, of different um, bodily functions, vitamin D is really important. And interestingly, when you look at different medical associations with vitamin D deficiency, you're, we're starting to see some associations. Um, does that mean that it's vitamin D deficiency specifically that's causing the illness? Um, again, that doesn't tend to be a magic answer. Certainly for diabetic neuropathy, we know there's a lot more that goes into it than vitamin D deficiency, but in some cases they're identifying patterns and I think in cases where these patterns could be useful or easy, simple, and um, to take advantage of, it's, it's helpful to discuss this research. So this is um, an article that was published in 2022, which talks about vitamin D and the prevention and treatment of diabetic neuropathy. And they found when they looked at a large number of patients with diabetic neuropathy and they compared them with patients without diabetic neuropathy, or, and they looked at all these vitamin D, uh, levels in these patients, they found that patients with diabetic neuropathy had a higher incidence of vitamin D deficiency compared with um, patients with diabetes who did not have vitamin D deficiency. And in some cases, so meaning it's not for 100% of patients, but for some patients, they saw that correcting vitamin D deficiency led to an improvement in neuropathy symptoms. I do want to highlight here that this does not mean if your vitamin D level is currently normal that taking extra will be helpful. That was not found, but especially in patients who have low vitamin D levels, they found that correcting that with supplementation if needed so that you had a normal vitamin D level could be beneficial. Um, and I think that, you know, for many people, checking a vitamin D level might be part of your routine annual exam. If it's not, it's something that's pretty easy to order and something you could discuss with your doctor or endocrinologist. They may have heard of this, these types of studies already. Um, and vitamin D, of course, is very easy to find and to come across. And I will say, from personal experience at least, especially in areas that have uh, wintry weather where it's cold and we're often covered up and maybe spending more time inside for a number of months during the winter, um, that vitamin D deficiency can be surprisingly prevalent. Um, and most people feel fine with it, but it, in, if it's your kind of moment in life where you might be thinking about preventing neuropathy or what to do about diabetic neuropathy, this might be an interesting option. All right, next I wanted to speak about briefly another specific type of peripheral neuropathy that we see and that there is actually a lot of research on and that is chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. This is very, very complex. Um, needless to say for anybody with chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, the main priority is really treatment of the cancer, but because some of these chemotherapy agents are so um, designed in a certain way to really kill cancer cells and stop cancer, some of those effects cross over to certain um, parts of our own body's function and impact those as well. And I think we can, you know, a lot of us can relate to the idea that, you know, some types of chemotherapy cause hair loss, for example, because they impact our hair cells, which are rapidly growing just normally as part of uh, life. 
And some of these chemotherapy agents, not all of them, but some of them have are known to have toxic effects on nerves. Um, also, what's interesting is that in order to try to understand chemotherapy, um, peripheral neuropathy, and try to prevent it or even treat it, uh, it doesn't look like in terms of a, a real treat answer to that, it's not a one size fits all because each of these drugs is different. And because they cause or contribute to toxic effects on the nerves in different ways, the way you would address that might also be different. And unfortunately, there is no current treatment to globally prevent chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, but I, um, there is a lot of research on it, and we'll get into that in uh, just a moment on the next slide. But people are certainly looking at this in terms of research. Some of the things, if this is um, something that you or a loved one is dealing with currently, uh, some of the things that might be helpful if um, you discuss with your oncologist in advance, maybe assessing the risk in advance uh, for possible neuropathy. Are there other factors which might put someone at a higher risk of neuropathy from chemotherapy? For example, if they already have diabetes or if, they have, um, if they're obese or have metabolic syndrome, there may be some cases, certainly I cannot comment on them whatsoever, and each of these are highly individualized cases depending on the situation with the cancer, but there may be cases where adjusting the chemotherapy timing may be considered in select cases. Um, very, there is nothing that again has been shown to be across the board effective for preventing chemotherapy um, induced peripheral neuropathy, but there are some there is some preliminary evidence. What does this mean? This means like smaller numbers of patients, um, maybe showing some positive effect for certain interventions, but we don't have larger scale studies or randomized control studies. But there is some preliminary evidence uh, for possible benefits of acupuncture, compression therapy, which is like wearing compression stockings, exercising, or cryotherapy, which involves uh, more or less putting like ice packs over your limbs during the chemotherapy infusions. We like with other types of uh, painful peripheral neuropathy, we also have tools for treating the symptoms of chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy, although that certainly is not the same as preventing it. And uh, one medication that was studied specifically for use in treating chemotherapy uh, related peripheral neuropathy is duloxetine or the brand name is known as Cymbalta. Um, other treatments may also be effective, but just have not been specifically studied to treat symptoms related to chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. This website is the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. This is something that anybody can go to if you type this in to Google or another search engine. And one of the things on there um, that I just wanted to point out because I thought it was very interesting and potentially useful is there is a search function where you can type in a word on the search and you can get a number of resources that this website organizes for you and then you can take advantage of them. And you can see when I just typed in, this is just a screenshot, when I typed in the word neuropathy, it came up with thousands of different results. Um, through the search engine, through the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And you can then um, choose what kind of information you want. Do you maybe want a patient resource? Are you interested in general information or news? Are you interested in journal like research articles? So I think this is a really great resource for anybody who might be in a position where you're looking specifically for this. There are certainly other resources, but this is a very easy to use a resource as well to find updated information and education. Now I wanted to move forward into like more of a general discussion about preventing neuropathy, but I think it's helpful first to, and I think it kind of illustrates uh, a few things that we're about to discuss. How do we know what we know? How do you, how do we know what helps prevent illness? Um, and again, we've seen that there is significant research that looks at outcomes in very specific groups who have peripheral neuropathy or risk factors for neuropathy, such as patients with diabetes. But when we learn about a risk factor for a cause of peripheral neuropathy, lifestyle recommendations for prevention usually evolve from trying to avoid or mitigate or control that cause. So, for example, once people recognize that oh, diabetes causes neuropathy, 
the first impulse was, well, it must be the diabetes and we should just control the diabetes. And as we've mentioned a couple times, even as we've learned more really over the very recent decades, there's a big difference between blood sugar alone and type one and type two diabetes and the impact, impact on neuropathy. So this, this evolves. And I think that in some ways, preventing neuropathy and what we know about it and where these ideas come from, some of it has to do with seeing what's causing neuropathy and learning from that. Um, there is no, unfortunately, absolute prevention for peripheral neuropathy across the board, um, in part because each of these different factors is so different. And frankly, also, this is you know, something that many of us can intuitively understand because for a number of patients, we still can't find what's causing the neuropathy. And I think and hope that as the years continue, we will have more research and more of an understanding of that in the decades to come. And that number, that percentage of idiopathic neuropathy will shrink. Um, but again, as a result of this, as a result of what we acknowledge today, we have a lot more understanding than we used to, but we don't have as much as we will in the future. We are doing the best we can now in terms of coming up with ideas for neuropathy prevention, but there is nothing that is across the board or absolute. So one of the things I think is really interesting and uh, to think about is when people talk about this, you know, epidemic of obesity. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that maintaining a healthy body weight has been shown to be important in terms of neuropathy prevention. And, and specifically when we talk about something called metabolic syndrome, which is often associated um, with abdominal obesity. And what is metabolic syndrome? So metabolic syndrome is a collection of symptoms that often occur together and people are seeing increasingly this collection of symptoms increases your risk, not just of neuropathy, but of diabetes, stroke, heart disease. And the main ingredients that tend to go together in metabolic syndrome include obesity, uh, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, which is the quote, good cholesterol, so less good cholesterol, and insulin resistance, which is a potential precursor to or linkage with diabetes. And a person's weight is a major cause of metabolic syndrome. And of course, we certainly know that, you know, there may be bodybuilders who have humongous muscle mass, who have very high body weights, but obviously, they're not obese and they don't have uh, metabolic syndrome. So what we're specifically thinking about is abdominal fat cells. So the abdominal girth, um, abdominal kind of focused obesity. And they has, there has been research that the abdominal fat cells specifically can trigger certain chemical reactions in the body that can influence uh, blood sugar levels. And studies have shown a higher risk of neuropathy, for example, in the setting of obesity, even in the absence of diabetes or prediabetes. So it's not just the fact that some of these fat cells may be lowering your ability to control your blood sugar levels, but even certain studies have shown there are other mechanisms at play. There are other things, other things going on that are potentially triggering neuropathy because of some effects, presumably chemical effects that are happening in the body in the setting of obesity. And there may be some interplay between lipid metabolism and calcium metabolism and inflammation. Um, again, a lot of this boils down to really specific kind of biochemical physiologic research. Um, but I think, you know, the research is really uh, showing a consistent trend. Um, and we're seeing more and more in recent years, more and more publications looking at the link between metabolic syndrome and the certain type of obesity associated with metabolic syndrome components um, and the risk of polyneuropathy. Now, I will say that, you know, for some patients, this may be, um, you know, this may fall into a idiopathic peripheral neuropathy case because there is no way for a patient who may have metabolic syndrome um, or obesity, there's no way to prove that that is what's causing neuropathy. And so in all cases, we would always be checking other vitamin levels, other possible causes of uh, neuropathy. But, but truthfully, if we take a step back and think what as a population can we do to try to prevent the incidence of peripheral neuropathy based on what we know now, 
um, maintaining a healthy body weight is certainly one of them. And speaking along those lines, I wanted to just take a moment and here we're looking at some um, really kind of nice graphic resources from Healthline website. Um, just taking a moment to think about like when you talk about diet, there's a lot of resources out there and there's some very simple resources. If you look, this is just one example of them, but very simple uh, resources that talk about what does a balanced diet mean and what do healthy portions mean, which as we know for um, many restaurants and culturally things have gotten gone kind of away from this. But balance of course is key and usually a healthy diet in terms of preventing neuropathy is, is really, what's needed um, and excessive supplements, which can be really marketed in very attractive ways uh, with very kind of alluring promises of health um, are often unnecessary if we go back to the basics and thinking about a healthy diet and healthy portions. And this is just another slide again, offering some uh, really quick kind of tips, especially for people who are you know, living in today's world and maybe busy. Um, some quick tips were using, just using smaller dinnerware in terms of proportions um, and looking at how much you're eating, um, that we, we tend to finish things that are on our plate. Having a smaller plate can help. And even looking at your plate almost like a pie chart and thinking about the proportions of different types of food in terms of protein, high fat foods, salads or vegetables, and how much space on your plate do you ideally wanna be devoting uh, to different types of foods. Um, and we can see that complex carbohydrates, for example, the recommendation is only a quarter of the plate at most um, to make sure that we're getting as much of uh, protein and other types of valuable nutrients as we need. And speaking about some specific nutrients, um, I wanted to just mention uh, some of the examples of different types of foods that are rich in nutrients that are known to be important uh, for prevention of neuropathy. Uh, one of them, a uh, number of them are B vitamins and vitamin B12 is one. We, we again know this because patients with vitamin B12 deficiency are at a higher risk of neuropathy, but foods that are um, high in vitamin B12 include meat, poultry, fish, and eggs, fortified soy milk and cereals and a number of other foods. Again, if you have a normal level of vitamin B12, that's all that's needed. You don't have to have a very high level. Um, and for many patients, having a healthy diet is sufficient. Vitamin B9 or folate is also important um, and green vegetables, legumes, fruits, nuts, beans, peas, eggs, um, and sorry, milk, not mild, milk are rich in uh, folate. For thiamine or vitamin B1, whole grains, meat, fish, and fortified cereals are often rich in thiamine. Shellfish, shellfish nuts, whole grain products, and beans are uh, rich in copper, which is also an important mineral that's critical for nerve health. And you know, thinking about for some patients, not for all, but for some patients, there um, is need to have attention to considering supplements in cases of a vegetarian or a vegan diet um, and for some people, I know they're very mindful of this and, and are able to organize their diet in a way where they get all of the nutrients, but it's just something to think about if you're embarking upon one of these uh, dietary um, lifestyles. And certainly the other special case I wanted to mention is any circumstance where nutrient absorption in the gut may be impaired. So this may be the case in patients with celiac disease. For some patients who've had certain types of bariatric surgery or other types of gastrointestinal disorders where absorbing nutrients may be um, challenged, those may be cases where we can anticipate in advance that regular dietary nutrient intake may not be enough and supplements or even monitoring uh, levels of vitamins in your blood may be needed. There is also this discussion of um, alcohol effect on nerves and avoiding excessive alcohol consumption. There are some old reports uh, looking at the effect of um, alcohol on causing peripheral neuropathy. Truthfully, usually it's in cases where they're very high, um, it's a high amount of alcohol consumption, not having you know, a glass of wine with dinner, so to speak. But the reason for this is thought because alcohol inhibits absorption of vital nutrients in the gut, including some of the B vitamins. So in some patients where we see this as a possible cause, we might actually 
um, be testing and identifying different vitamin deficiencies, which are um, linked to um, absorption impairment from the alcohol. And of course, as we've discussed, a lot of avoiding excess sugar is also important uh, for a, a neuropathy prevention lifestyle. Physical activity. So physical activity, there's a lot of um, information that's there about that as well. And we do see that uh, certainly physical activity is important for maintaining a healthy weight, which we know is important for um, uh, preventing neuropathy. Interestingly, just a couple slides back, we also heard that physical exercise was also found to be helpful in potentially preventing chemotherapy related peripheral neuropathy in some small, um, small samples of patients. But when we think about it, um, in terms of maintaining a healthy weight, certainly most weight loss comes from attention to how much, how many calories you're taking in. Um, but according to the CDC, maintaining a current healthy weight certainly also requires some physical activity. Um, and the current recommendation in terms of people who might say how much is recommended in general, uh, the current recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week. So that could be a brisk walk. Um, and depending on uh, where you live, you know, that might be something that you're doing just kind of going about your daily work. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is a focused uh, type of you know, gym session, if you will. Um, I've certainly, you know, met people who decide they're going to take the stairs if, if that's something that they can do, recognizing not everyone has the same mobility um, abilities, uh, but something as simple as choosing to take the stairs um, sometimes instead of taking the elevator can also be helpful and be a way to um, help increase your physical activity. Interestingly, I will say that other benefits of regular physical activity, aside from maintaining healthy weight, um, and preventing um, or mitigating metabolic syndrome, which can increase the risk of neuropathy, can include improved sleep, reduced risk of diabetes, um, improved um, high blood pressure, and reduced risk of stroke, reduced risk of arthritis, osteoporosis, and even reduced depression and anxiety. And there have been a lot of studies looking at the benefits of physical activity, and again, this doesn't have to be intense or expensive or elaborate. It can be as simple as um, you know, taking a walk five days a week. So I wanted to kind of uh, wrap up a little bit thinking specifically about preventing neuropathy to thinking about prevention overall with neuropathy and other types of neurological illness and thinking about Again, when we talked about that PubMed uh, search arc and looking at how where we are now compared to 40 or 70 years ago in terms of more research and focus on prevention, we can already see the beginnings, and I think they're pretty exciting, about where things are headed in the future. So this is an initiative that I wanted to share, which is a, a focused initiative on behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, which is uh, probably the largest uh, neurological professional society, certainly um, in the United States and one of the largest in the world. And they have undertaken a recent initiative, uh, which they call brain health, um, but really they mean nervous system health, but they thought it was uh, a little more appealing to legislatures and others to phrase it as brain health. Um, and there actually was a recent publication uh, where they uh, wrote a special article really in sort of launching this initiative, they called it a brain health imperative in the 21st century, a call to action. And they, dis, they defined brain health because I think we've spent so much of the last century really defining and identifying disease. The whole idea is how do we pivot from that a little bit and take a step back and start defining and focusing on health and focusing our efforts on health so that we are not as much in the position of having to wait until people have different types of diseases. So brain health, they just define as a continuous state of attaining and maintaining the optimal neurological function that best supports one's physical, mental, and social well-being through every stage of life. And this is, uh, you know, what does that mean? Um, they go through different aspirational examples of what this could look like, like what could some specific examples related to nervous system health really look like with this? 
So they're thinking, you know, ideally, what could we, what are we thinking about? What are we aiming towards? Thinking about um, introducing prevention training into different types of even thinking about like medical school education or, you know, how physicians or other healthcare providers are educated that this now is really focused on um, treating disease and identifying disease, but really looking at introducing this training um, at those levels. And it is really um, something that I think is at a number of different scopes. So one, or scales rather, one is of course the whole population and what we know. And the other is how to speak to and customize recommendations to individual people based on what's happening with them and at what point of life they're at and what other health concerns they may already have. Uh, we certainly are seeing already certain types of a uh, lot of research that's giving us knowledge. And I think this push is trying to say, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to steer this going forward and really translate it in a meaningful way into patient care? Um, they're also looking at uh, different types of new careers. How could we develop new public health careers focusing on prevention and nervous system prevention? And also there's different focus as part of this initiative, which I think is exciting and looking at um, lobbying and legislation, because if we are going to develop a body of knowledge, if we are going to train people to be able to implement this and help patients, we need support to book, for example, an appointment with a neurologist, maybe for a preventive health visit and have insurance companies cover that. And so, and have other um, support from different types of uh, Medicare and Medicaid and other types of insurance companies to recognize the importance of this and to support it um, and to provide other incentives, of course, for people to be able to take advantage of these things. So I think this is real. This is something you can sink your teeth into. Um, this is happening. And this is really just the beginning of this particular initiative. And I think it also speaks uh, very clearly to where we stand with peripheral neuropathy and looking at health prevention, sorry, disease prevention um, and preventing disease. Um, and so this will be exciting to follow in the years going forward. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to have a representative from this group join us at a future webinar. And hopefully we'll be able to have um, more detailed updates and exciting updates uh, that come out of this specific initiative and others like it in the years to come. This is really just a lot of references that went into making this uh, presentation. And uh, thank you all very much. Look forward to some interesting discussion. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Um, yes, yeah, so we do have quite a few questions that came in during the uh, program. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. We're going to try to cover as many as we can, as many as we can in the remaining time. Um, so what is your take on prevention and progression of this disease? So obviously there's a lot of folks on here that already have peripheral neuropathy. How do you recommend that they slow down their progression of the disease? And I know that's a very loaded question, but hoping that maybe you can address it. Thank you. So I think what's interesting is that because we don't have focused prevention neurology appointments right now, um, I tend to see the most patients that I tend to see are exactly that patients who already we've identified neuropathy and we are truly trying to figure out how to prevent the progression. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's obviously, as we mentioned, it's a big umbrella condition. So what we tend to do first is try to see, can we identify what's causing it? Um, if we can identify what's causing the neuropathy, in some cases we can do something about it. So if it's a vitamin deficiency, we say we're gonna address the vitamin deficiency. Um, if it is diabetes, then we look at this, it may be a very focused approach of blood sugar control or a much broader blood sugar plus other metabolic factors, um, lifestyle um, changes that we talk about. In cases where it is idiopathic, we don't know the cause of the neuropathy, um, we take a step back and say, you know, we don't know what this is. Frankly, I think in some cases, it could mean it was something transient um, that caused it and it might already get better on its own. Um, what I will say is for many patients, they have done studies for many patients who are in particular older patients with a milder 
chronic form of like a distal sensory neuropathy, like foot numbness, maybe some imbalance. Um, there have been some studies for those group of idiopathic patients that it tends to be very slowly progressive. And so in some cases they're looking, just even looking at the population now and following some of these patients forward. And we can get some positive information that says we can do the best we can, but what we know is the longer that you have this condition, if it remains relatively similar, if it's idiopathic, the research has told us that the chances are it will continue to also be very slowly progressive and, and not change dramatically going forward. That may not be as positive of a message as, say, a cure, but for many patients who might be scared about what the coming five or 10 years may hold, that may be a hopeful message. Um, I will yeah. say that, you know, what we tend to do is we take a broad survey, um, looking first at seeing if we can identify a cause and then taking a step back and thinking about what we know. And, uh, and then people can choose what, you know, speaks to them or what might be an opportunity for them in terms of nerve health interventions overall. Um, and hopefully that will help prevent the progression. But again, going back to the very beginning of this talk, we don't know, and we certainly can't, you know, have people blaming themselves if the neuropathy does get worse. Um, so again, we just do the best you can where you are and try to really focus on educating patients. And always, we're talking here today a lot about prevention and uh, preventing progressions, but always in tandem with that, we're looking at maintaining as um, good and full of a quality of life as possible through managing the symptoms, which was not the topic of today's discussion, but that can make a big difference and we focus on that as well. Yeah, you know, and I think a lot of our patients have expressed kind of frustration in that they only get, you know, 10 to 15 minutes with their doctor on an annual basis. How do you recommend a patient gets the proper medical attention when they just don't have enough time one on one with a healthcare professional like yourself? I think one of the things that can be helpful in some cases, so first of all, I wish I had a magic wand and like everybody just got an hour with their doctors, like that would be amazing. So believe me, we're all in the same boat when we think that would be the best thing ever. But to take a step back and, and look at sort of what tips might be helpful or what things I've seen that help some patients dealing with the realities of today, can be one it depends on your situation but i think things that can be helpful include thinking of it as a team approach and instead of focusing on one specific doctor who you're going to see if there are other related doctors that might be helpful who also overlap in this field it may be helpful to think of a team approach you may get better care you may get different opinions that might be helpful frankly i mean certainly you'll get more time so different types of doctors just to, or providers, just to give you some examples, things that might be helpful could include, could include your primary care doctor. Um, I think sadly, many primary care doctors are among the most thinly spread in today's um, medical landscape, but having a good primary doctor is important. Having a neurologist who specializes in neuropathy can be helpful or any neurologist can be helpful. Um, if it's a general neurologist who knows a lot about neuropathy, so that you can have visits with them and discuss things. If pain is unfortunately a really salient concern, having appointments sometimes with a dedicated pain specialist can be helpful. They may not be focusing on discussing the neuropathy, but they may have really great things to offer in terms of helping symptoms. If your neuropathy is known to be from diabetes, sometimes working with a diabetes specialist like an endocrinologist can be very helpful. And many of them, I would say all of them, because this is such a prevalent issue, are really well versed in neuropathy related to those conditions as well. So those are just some ideas, but I would say kind of thinking about a team approach um, may be helpful if it is not possible to have the, you know, the fantasy of the one doctor who will sit with you for an hour for every visit. The other thing that can be helpful to ask about when you're seeing some different providers is finding out do they have a broader team who you can use as a resource? So not every physician, but many may have, for example, a nurse practitioner who works with them in their office and is very knowledgeable. They can be extremely knowledgeable, especially if they've had a lot of experience. And so it may be not possible for you to have as frequent visits with your 
physician, but it might be the case that you could have more frequent and longer visits with the nurse, nurse practitioner who has a lot more time um, and a lot of experience as well, and that can be helpful. Um, and the last thing I will mention is that sometimes an opportunity that might be convenient for you and might be convenient for some providers can to help you get more, more time is uh, video visits. And so uh, I think, you know, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of virtual medical care and um, now we're seeing it paired back in some ways. I personally don't like seeing any new patients over video visits unless it's an emergency because I can't really examine you fully. I can't look at your feet or test your sensation or reflexes over a camera. But for many patients who um, it's, you know, they have to commute to come into the office and we're talking about their neuropathy and we're talking about their pain and their symptoms and how they're doing, um, we can schedule video visits. And sometimes those can be a little easier um, to get in more frequent appointment times uh, than the in-person appointment. So that may be another option for some. Yeah, no, that's actually extremely helpful. Uh, thank you. Um, you had started your your discussion on mindfulness, and I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about maybe also just stress, right? So not blaming yourself, but maybe how does stress play in either the cause or the management of someone's peripheral neuropathy? So stress by itself doesn't cause peripheral neuropathy. Um, it doesn't. So that's so if if you're worried about you have neuropathy and is it only because you're stressed? The answer is no. Okay. Um, but after that, stress can contribute to a lot of things. Um, stress can definitely make neuropathy feel worse. Uh, stress can sometimes make it hard for you to sleep. And if you have pain and if you're not sleeping, that can make pain worse. Um, there is just like this in amazing link, and it almost sounds like cliche, but study after study bears it out to be true between stress and, um, you know, endorphins. Um, and there have been research studies that have looked at uh, people have a harder time even maintaining a healthy weight when they have chronic stress because these endorphins that are constantly circulating change your metabolism um, in certain ways um, and the effect of stress on pain. And um, I've definitely had patients, granted there's so many different things changing, it's hard to know what, but who've said to me, oh, I've you know, had this horrible symptoms, horrible neuropathy symptoms, and then I see them a couple months later and they said, oh, I went to the beach in Florida and walked around in the sand and my neuropathy felt like much better right away. <laughs> like, okay. So the nerves didn't change like week to week, but it can be a really powerful shift um, in some cases, you know, thinking about stress. Now I will say on the beach in Florida, it may be soft sand, warm temperature, not wearing tight shoes, who knows, a lot of things, but definitely stress can make neuropathy symptoms worse. And I have also seen a lot of patients when they are in a stressful moment, it can be about anything, not just their, um, you know, not specifically about their health. Um, and a lot of things just feel worse. Pain feels worse. Yeah. Things, things bother you more. Um, it's harder to have things roll off yeah. kind of enjoy your day. It is very, it's a, it sounds cliche sometimes, but it is a really big effect. And there are certain diseases where we know, frankly, stress does cause them. Like headaches in some cases can be triggered by stress. Even for people who have a seizure disorder, stress doesn't cause a seizure disorder, but stress can, for some of those patients, help trigger seizures. So it is yeah. a really, you know, it sounds almost, again, like, oh, stress, you know, but it's a really, I'm not saying that we should try to avoid stress because it sometimes is unavoidable, but paying attention to it in a mindful way and how you respond to it and how you internalize it is so important. So, and it's an interesting segue into the next question I have, because obviously we're, you know, patients that have peripheral neuropathy, right? There currently, there aren't any cures. Um, not all treatments are working for everybody. 
So people are starting to feel hopeless and, and depressed. And what, what would you say to these folks? What would you, what, you know, what, what's out there to get people excited um, for their future of managing their symptoms, especially for folks that do in fact have neuropathy right now? Sure. So I think again, um, again, with that mindfulness website or website mindset, um, and there are lots of websites thinking about you know, this again, there's this saying that focusing on, you know, accepting the things that you can't change and and thinking about what you can change. I think that's really important and it's very much ties into mindfulness. So if there is an, an, an anything that's happening, whether it's neuropathy or something else, thinking about can you change that, can you fix it, make it go away? And if you can't, trying as best you can, you may not like it. You don't have to like it, but it's just coming to terms with it and then thinking about what you can do. And then I think from that perspective, it's very individualized. It's about what's happening with you and the neuropathy. For some people, I found that they don't know what their diagnosis is. And for some people, I find they feel a lot better just having a diagnosis after we go through a workup and they say, oh my gosh, people told me I was crazy or I thought it was this yeah. or that. And for some people, a lot of that dissipates as soon as they just have a diagnosis and they feel validated. And they're like, you know, it doesn't even bother me that much. I just really felt like I was going crazy. I didn't know what was wrong. If pain is a problem, certainly, you know, look, making sure you're doing due diligence with your doctors and looking into what the causes might be, especially things you could do something about. But if pain is a big problem, you know, focusing on what you can do about, about pain, because there are a lot of treatments for pain. And yes, they are not all going to work for everyone. It is completely a pattern of trial and error, figuring out what works for you without causing side effects that are a problem. Um, if mobility or balance is a, is a concern and a big source of frustration, physical therapy can be very helpful. Again, will physical therapy make your neuropathy go away or reverse things back to normal? No, but it can do a lot to help maximize the function that you have based on what is working. And sometimes it's easy to forget that, you know, yeah. that, you know, if you work on practicing balance or work on practicing anticipating moments that can be challenging, that you can actually get a significant boost in the quality of life. Um, so I think looking at, um, again, mindfulness of of what you can versus what you can't do something about, and then thinking about what is it for you that is the most challenging or the hardest and focusing on that. Because in, in a lot of cases, there is something to be done. Yeah, no, yeah, that um, that's very helpful. And I'm, I'm hopeful that also the folks that are watching today's program will also appreciate that the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy is here. We pride ourselves on being a community um, as also a resource um, of great educational information for folks to, to make sure that they still feel connected um, and empowered to you know, have a lot of these conversations with their healthcare providers um, to get the answers that they're looking for. And in the meantime, we will continue to fund the great research that people are doing out there um, and advocate for patients. And we're hopeful that um, with every tomorrow, we'll get more answers and more of an understanding of what this condition is. So Dr. Patterson, thank you again so much. Um, I'm so sorry that we were unable to address a lot of the other questions that we weren't able to get to, but we are here as a resource, as I mentioned. So I encourage everyone to reach out to us through phone, through email, um, or also check out our website. We hope that you guys enjoyed this program. We were going to have this recorded and put up on our website indefinitely. So this will be a great resource for people to, to kind of consult for future needs of prevention and, and also progression. Um, so thank you again so much, Dr. Patterson, for your expertise. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And um, we hope to see you guys soon. Thank you again.